Okay, well, I am with Boulder Public Library. The Bee Chicas are on screen with me, and Shannon is behind the scenes engineering the live stream. Before we begin, I will briefly cover some housekeeping. First, this event is being recorded and will be available on Boulder Public Library's YouTube channel and the Seed to Table playlist after today. And you may also subscribe to the Bee Chica playlist on the library's um, channel website on the YouTube to see more events. All of our events are an extension of library services. And so library conduct policies apply in our online space. We invite you to visit our website at boulderlibrary.org for a full events um, calendar, including seed to table events, which focus on sustainable living with gardening, cooking, and Bee Chica workshops. I'd also like to thank the Boulder Library Foundation for its generous sponsorship of this and so many of our events. And finally, at any time during this event, you can post your questions in the chat by logging into Google, YouTube, or Facebook accounts. The Bee Chicas will answer questions after their 30-minute presentation on gardening for the birds and the bees. Boulder Public Library and the City of Boulder have been working with the Bee Chicas since 2015 for seat to table workshops. You may also see them on the Boulder Creek Path taking care of the library beehives on the main library roof in their colorful beekeeper suits. The Bee Chicas are also volunteer coordinators for Pollinator Appreciation Month and the Boulder Bee Festival in September. Visit their website, beechicas.com, for resources, recipes, and videos. And so I would like to introduce Tracy Bell Humer, Teresa Beck, Deborah Foy, Cynthia Scott, all our gardeners, artists, beekeepers, and pollinator advocates. And Bee Chicas, I want to thank you for adapting the, what would be an in-person workshop in normal days, days to an online experience. Teresa is going to start us off with an overview of healthy soil and the soil food web. Hi, welcome to our workshop. This is a very comprehensive workshop. We're moving from healthy soil, which is the foundation of all life, to plants and then insects and rounded off with birds. So what is soil? Um, we'll look at the first slide and see uh, Cynthia has some leaves in her hand, which is decaying humus, decaying plant matter. Soil is actually made out of particles. So you've got um, dirt, which is sand, silt, clay, and aggregates such as little rock particles like basalt and granite and quartz and minerals. And so you add to that, you add humus, which is actually um, organic matter that is in the remains of living organisms in various forms. And so therefore they contain all the nutrients that are required for life. And they make soil come alive because they're the food for microorganisms. And there are billions of microorganisms, even in one teaspoon of soil, there are more uh, microorganisms than all the people on earth. And um, so we um, want to protect that by not using chemicals that will kill them. We want to leave the leaves um, and it mimics the, the forest floor when we start um, stratifying our gardens and adding um, organic matter so that the microorganisms have a place to live um, and insects and, and other animals. Um, I'll talk later about compost because that also um, is a, a mimicry of the soil floor in its many layers and strata of decaying um, humus into nutrients. So we'll look at the next slide. And this next slide talks about the soil food web. I'm not gonna go into like how it all works, but we all know that plants get their energy from the sun and convert it into sugars and they grow and they um, send out roots and the roots um, create in the soil a place for microorganisms to um, live and like nematodes and which feed on roots, mycorrhizal fungi, which actually are like a symbiotic relationship with roots that help them uptake phosphorus and water, very beneficial. And then there's a lot of other anaerobic, anaerobic microorganisms, 
um, that are food for the larger um, shredders and choppers and earthworms. Earthworms are, I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a slide, in a video we're going to see, but um, they make a super rich worm casting excrement that feeds the plants. And as I said, the, the, the humus is part of that and it feeds all of us because we're all interrelated. And then this is a very cool little creature called a water bear or a moss piglet. That's the real name, tardigrade. And they live all over the world from the Antarctic to tropi tropics, volcanoes, what the, in pressure, low pressure, high pressure. They've been radiated and starved and uh, they still are alive all over the world. There they are. The first part one was just an illustration. Um, kind of a computer anima animated illustration. And the last one was their actual um, uh, creatures. And so I just wanted to show you that the soil is actually alive. They, they live in lichens and mosses. They call them moss piglets because they look like little pigs. Um, but they're just one of the millions, billions of, of microorganisms. And um, this is a cover crop, I'm not sure if uh, any of you are familiar, some of you are, with green manure or cover crops. Um, what we like to do is keep the soil covered because that protects the soil from being uh, from erosion and drying out because we want to maintain water in our soils. So this is from Deborah's garden, and I think maybe a little bit later she'll explain a little more about cover crops. But this is a fava bean on the left, and then on the right are the roots that go down and have nitrogen nodules that are growing on the roots. And what the roots do is they mine into the soil, they break up particles in the soil and they leave the um, nitrogen in an available um, food form for plants to take up. And they also, I put down no need to till because we do want to maintain the um, structure of the soil by not turning it over. Because when we turn over the soil, we're actually burying the aerobic microorganisms, which kills them. And then we're taking up the anaerobic, which live below, and, and they die as well. So we're actually killing the microorganisms when we turn our soil. And it's for the first year, our plants are do great. They, they were killing them, they are, have available food, but by the next year, our soil structure is so much more compacted. So super, super gets to be like hard pan packed um, soil. So, and one more thing about tilling, rototilling really chops up all of the soil structure. It, it, it pulverizes the aggregates and aggregates are super important because the sand and the pebbles and all the, the clay, they're all different sizes and they let water go down into and in between the plants. And um, if we pulverize everything, we're just making everything the same size, which ruins the soil structure. So here are, Oh, good. This is, these are bees and they're all over these leaves and they're actually mining for minerals. And we're not sure why they do this, but we think it has something to do with their gut biome. And they're taking up water from the, from the earth and the leaves. And we think it's uh, keeping them healthy. And then the, this is an earthworm, very fast. I did a time lapse. But what worms do is they go way, way down into the soil and they add air and they bring up minerals. And of course they do, they make excrement, which is worm castings. And so, and they shred and they chop and they eat up all of, the, of those decaying leaves and other matter. And then we might have one more video, it's coming up, um, but we'll see. If it's, if it's me in the garden, I was going to talk about a broad fork, which I can just talk about without the video. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is the coolest tool. I got it this year. I usually use a garden fork, which is very small with four tines. And this is called a broad fork. And you push it down and you pull it back and forth. And it opens up 
um, a little hole and it, you can put down compost, you can water with it. And so it keeps the soil structure and the stratas and the aerobic great uh, microorganism on top, the anaerobic down below. And also there's something called a faculative um, anaerobe, which can either be um, aerobic or um, anaerobic. That's a, another really cool microorganism. But that you can use that to maintain your soil structure without tilling. And I guess that ends my my talk, my quick talk on healthy soil. I won't talk about compost. I don't have enough time. So we're going to uh, let Cynthia talk about plants. Thanks, Teresa. So if you've taken good care of your soil, it should be easy for you to have healthy plants. And we're just going to talk about how to be an eco gardener. Um, all of these things, I'm not going to read the list, but um, it's just how to garden from the soil to the treetops, keep your soil healthy, um, have layers of plants. Like in this particular slide, you see the trees in the background, and then you see the Joe pie weed and some native brown eyed Susans. And uh, um, there's the purple asters that just pop out in the middle and then in front, there's some sedums. All of these plants are great host plants and also um, help the whole ecosystem and they're connected, they're planted tightly together in large groups so that um, insects and pollinators have an easy job in this garden. So the next slide will show, um, so in the springtime, this is another layered effect. This beautiful fruit tree is the cherry trees that are blooming and it's one fruit tree is like planting a meadow's worth of flowers. But this slide ha shows those fruit trees, but also the whole planting below the fruit trees. You can see um, flowering Brunera in there. There's dandelions, which we love. There's bare ground. There's a rock wall along the edge, which is native um, habitat for native bees and other ground nesting insects. And um, gr they're great hosts. So this is a whole ecosystem including a few uh, choice plants. So next slide. I'm going to show you a few profiles of just a couple of plants that I would not want to, to do without in my garden. I like this um, Mahonia repens creeping Oregon grape because it's evergreen and it's one of the first um, pollinator plants that has nectar in the spring. If you look really closely, you can see a teeny tiny, I think it is a parasitic wasp on its, this is like you know, less than a quarter of an inch long. And this is a beautiful bone hardy native. So next, you also want to plant for the birds in your garden. And this is for birds and bees, actually. Pinstamins are wonderful choice. Big pop of color. I think I really moved into the bright colors after visiting my daughter in India. And it's just a beautiful welcome early summer plant. Um, tall pinstamins, but actually any pinstamin will attract um, the birds and the bees. Next slide. You also want to think about planting things that will bloom from the beginning of the season to the end. This geranium blooms starting in June and will be a beautiful nectar and pollen source throughout the entire growing season. So the next slide. Don't forget to add grasses. If you look really closely at the grass on the left hand side, this was a, a bunch wheat grass that it's a tall grass and it just for some reason was leaning over my path. So in about August, I cut it off about a foot or foot and a half off the ground and just left it there. I wasn't really even thinking, I just kind of wanted to get it off the path. And then this spring, I came back to that same plant. And if you look carefully in the ends of these grasses, you can see native bee resin plugs. So it has been inhabited by bees and all because I was a lazy gardener. So we want to encourage you always to, to be a lazy gardener and, and create these beautiful habitats. Um, grasses are a great place for birds to go to get um, 
little um, insects and and caterpillars. So they're also a really great place if you don't cut them back in the fall and you leave them until late spring after those bees have emerged and, and insects have crawled up from underneath. Um, you'll have so many more wonderful, beautiful ecosystem going on under those those grass um, grasses that are are making little tents or shelters for the, the bugs and everything. So next slide. Those grasses also have beautiful, it can add beautiful color to your garden with the grasses. And so now let's talk about how you can attract things to your garden. So when you're thinking about creating a garden, don't just think about the, what beautiful flower is gonna look good in your garden. Think about what butterfly it might attract. So if you want the monarch butterfly, you need to host the monarch caterpillar. And to host the caterpillar, you need Asclepius, um, tuberosa, or liatris spicata is another great um, host plant for monarchs and other um, butterflies like the queen butterfly. And it also is wonderful for goldfinches, the seeds of the liatris, and it attracts hummingbirds and bees. So these are both plants I wouldn't want to do without in my garden. Next slide. And of course, if you want the swallowtail butterfly, you need fennel or dill. Next slide. This is a list that I'm not gonna read through because of time, but it'll be on our website. And it's just um, a way to think about, like if you really like the beautiful painted lady, then you can plant Joe Pye weed. And, and if you plant it, they will come. It's really true. So next slide. I also am a beekeeper, so I like to look at the pollen on my flowers. And I can see it not only on the bees in their pollen pockets, but I can also see it in my beehive, which is really exciting. The scylla, which is blooming right now, is a bulb, and it has bright blue pollen. The foxtail lilies, which come out a little bit later, have bright magenta pollen, and they're just stunning. And of course, colchicum, which is the very last thing that's going to bloom in the fall. It's like a fall crocus, but it's different. It's much bigger. And that has bright orange pollen. And the scabiosa on the right, this black knight, has bright pink pollen. So that's really fun thing to think about. Next slide. Of course, your lawn is an opportunity. It's usually one of the sunniest places in your yard. Right now, the sweet violets are blooming and the dandelions are coming out and it's just a feast. So why not let your, your lawn be a feast for insects and pollinators of every kind? Next slide. And of course, if you want different pollinators and different types of insects in your yard, plant or diversity by planting different shaped flowers like umbels and flat daisies and those um, foxgloves that hummingbirds and bumblebees can climb right up into. Next slide. Of course, don't forget annuals. Annuals have merit if they have open pollen like these um, Cosmos rubenza and um, and I also just wanted to say again, like I always say, plant um, a few extra vegetables, root vegetables in your garden and let them flower. And um, artichokes, if you leave an artichoke, you will be so happy and so will all of the bees because they're such big thistle-like blooms that are just a, an abundance for the, for the pollinators and fun to watch them rolling around in that. So next we're gonna have a little video of, when you actually decide to leave your carrots. These are just carrots that I left in the ground over the winter and the next spring and summer, they were full of so many flying wasps and tiny little bees. And this is an isodontia wasp that's a beautiful pollinator. And it was my most fun place to look for um, native bees and wasps and also the honeybees would land on it too um, for, for the whole summer. It was a long um, season of blooms. So don't forget that arugula will bloom, um, beets will bloom, turnips will bloom, um, 
not to mention all of your squash and pumpkins and things like that. So plant a diversity and you'll, you'll get a diversity. And now I'll turn it over to Deborah, who's going to talk about um, more about insects and critters. So great to see that on a day like today, especially. Um, so we, we all know about important pollinating insects like honeybees and native bees and how important they are to our food systems and our natural habitats. But beyond pollinators, most people don't think of bugs as being our allies in the garden. I think they think of them as something to get rid of or even something to fear, but we want to change that. Next slide, please. Maybe you're not as familiar with this group of insects. Beneficial predatory insects are so cool. Instead of reaching for a chemical solution, you can let natural predators take care of plant eating insects and you will have more birds, butterflies and bees visiting your gardens than ever before. These are the types of bugs that we want to encourage and support in our gardens. And roughly they can be broken down into two categories, predators who actively hunt for prey and parasitoids who lay eggs and live in other insects for part of their life cycle. And there, there are over 1 million identified insects. We definitely don't have time for that today, but I am going to focus on a few of the most familiar or maybe common ones that you'll see in your gardens. On the next slide, we have praying mantis. These insects are so beautiful. They are such elegant insects in the garden. There are seven kinds of mantids in Colorado. Five of them are native, but they're found in the warmer southern regions of the state. The ones we'll find in our gardens here are introduced European mantids. And up in the corner, you'll see a picture of an egg sac I found in my garden a couple of years ago. And it's a couple inches tall. If you see that on a post or a fence or a garden shed, you'll know that you have mantids reproducing in your garden. And these, even though they're introduced, have become so common, they're actually the state insect of Connecticut. Um, on the next slide, I think we have stink bugs. And there, there are a lot of plant feeding stink bugs but this two-spotted stink bug is a very important predator species. Um, they're specialist predators, especially of beetles and the Colorado potato beetle. And you, you may be unaware that when plants are being attacked by pests, they actually release a chemical signal that attracts beneficial predatory insects. It's kind of like ringing the dinner bell. And they want those insects to come and help protect them from these pests. And so if you're patient and you wait, it may take a little bit, you'll be rewarded with natural pest control. And um, pirate bugs are teeny tiny little um, predators with a huge appetite. They feast on a whole host of different soft bodied insects. In fact, they are so effective at what they do, they're actually being bred commercially and used in greenhouses um, for pest control. I th Oh, well, our favorite ladybugs. Um, we're all familiar with lady beetles or ladybugs. I was surprised to learn that we have over 80 species here in Colorado. Um, I was searching through my camera roll, looking for pictures of the larva especially, which look like tiny little black and orange alligators because they are voracious hunters and eaters. And if you see that tiny little alligator-like insect, you know you have a very helpful predatory um, insect in your garden that will keep your aphid populations under control. Um, I couldn't find any pictures and I had texted the chicas, does anyone have any pictures of lady beetles? And then I remembered that um, fava bean host crop, um, cover crop that Teresa mentioned earlier. And I ran down to my garden just, I mean, literally Sunday, a few days ago when it was still nice. And that fava bean cover crop was hosting a million aphids and it was absolutely covered with ladybug larva and ladybug adults. So yet another reason to plant cover crops. Um, 
lace wings, such an elegant bug and so effective at insect, pest insect control. The adults act actually eat um, nectar and pollen, but the larvae are called aphid lions. So I don't need to say much more than that. Um, the next slide is ground beetles. And when I was pulling my slides together, I read, if you're ever in doubt about insect ID, guess ground beetles and, or guess beetles. And for good reason, because there are literally thousands of different species of beetles that inhabit every part of the planet. Um, ground beetles are an especially important um, garden insect. Both the adults and the larvae feed on a, a whole host of different insects. The larvae live in the top one or two inches of the soil, so you'll probably never really see them. And the adults um, are nocturnal. They hunt at night. So if you see a beetle sort of lumbering through your garden during the day, chances are it's probably a plant eating beetle and not the um, predatory species. Um, I think, oh, surfeit flies. They are definitely a gardener's friend. They're often um, confused for bees because they're striped like bees and they have pollinator coloration. The adults are, are pollinators. They feed on nectar and pollen, but the larvae are big predatory hunters of soft-bodied insects. Um, they are also a very important um, pest control insect for the early spring because the temperatures can often be too cold for other insects and flies can um, withstand much colder temperatures. So they're a good early season aphid control, especially. Um, I think our next one is somewhat controversial. People have mixed feelings about wasps. Um, our hunting wasp, these three species in particular, prey on insects. The um, aerial yellow jacket and the bald-faced hornet primarily feed their young on chewed up caterpillars and small insects. Unlike the sort of notorious Western yellow jacket, they are not um, attracted to picnics or food or garbage. And all wasps really shouldn't be treated equally. These are important beneficial insects to the garden. And Cynthia has a perfect example of a story on that subject. So I have a beloved giant oak tree in my yard that was infected with the Kermes scale. And I had for years trapped my yellow jackets in a yellow jacket pheromone trap only to find out that the one predator or one or two predators of the Kermi scale was the yellow jacket that I was trapping and keeping away from my tree. So I learned my lesson there. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up with parasitoids. And these are three of the most common we may encounter in our gardens. They're all excellent predatory species. They lay their eggs on different insect pests and eventually killing those hosts but the adult wasps also hunt um, insect prey. The brachinoid wasps are so effective at what they do in pest control that they're actually being introduced in um, agriculture. And their excellent control of, I read, the tomato hornworm. So that picture is a tomato hornworm um, that I dug up from my garden last fall. I found it in the soil. And um, I'm really hoping that these paras parasitoid wasps show up to take care of that for me because where there's one, there's probably many more. Um, and just, just to get you as excited about these insects as we are and all insects, you won't be surprised to read that many of the things you should do to support them have already been mentioned by Teresa and Cynthia. Um, do uh, plant a full season of 
host plants. Insects need um, food and shelter the full season long. Get familiar with the adult and the larval stages. In many cases, the larval stages of insects are the most voracious hunters and feeders. So know what that ladybug larva and the lacewing larva look like, those tiny little alligators. Of course, no pesticides, leave the leaves, that's where insects live. And then we love Doug Talame, and he said something in a, in a presentation a while ago, and we're, we've nicknamed it the 10-step program. He says, if you think you have an insect problem, take 10 steps back and suddenly your insect problem disappears. So Tracy and birds. Thanks, Debra. Uh, so birds were, uh, I chose to talk about birds because I wanted to do a little more research about birds in our gardens and our backyards in Boulder. And first, the sad part I'm gonna, I discovered, um, we've lost about 30% of our bird populations in the last like 50 years. We have 3 billion less, less birds and um, declining mostly in the grasslands. There's a 50% loss in our grasslands. Um, so we're in our group sixth grade extinction event, and this is the first one that's human caused. Um, most of these, um, these, most of our terrestrial birds, they rear their young on insects. So it's really important to hear like how we can support insects in our garden and let our plants get munched um, because those are going to attract um, birds or they might turn into a butterfly like if we leave our caterpillars for instance um so it takes uh for a brood of chickadees about ten thousand insects um to to feed a brood of chickadees and you can see um these photos here uh, this is cynthia's um uh birdhouse it's part of a um, the boulder chickadee study um through cu and um there's three of us bichicas that have these boxes on our on our um, in our yards, and so um, the top right is a is a chickadee, um, and then the um, oh, the um, the eggs that you're looking at are actually wren eggs, and um, I had another photo that I added, Kathy, that had um, that I think nuthatch eggs. So I think um, I hope that this slide next slide is updated too because I've been updating some of them. Okay, good. Um, so a little bit about how you can help birds. So this is the positive piece is, um, is open up a bird buffet in your yard. Uh, native plants attract more insects. Um, you, you might have um, seen chickadees in your, in your yard uh, feasting in the trees, they're going to skip over your non-native tree species and go to those those native ones. So there's a study in University of Delaware where um, the chickadees, uh, mother chickadee nesting would fly over the nearby non-natives and go to an oak tree to forage because she knew there was no food at the, at the nearby trees. Um, so um, another thing you can do is leave the leaves alone underneath trees. That's where caterpillars can complete their life cycle. So if you don't, if you wait until late spring of the following year and remove those leaves, it's, it's so many more, um, insects are supported, um, soil and, and your top predators, your birds. And then having winter feeders is a great idea. Um, seed and suet and year round is good too. There, there's a resource at the end that I can share with you um, about where to get information on what kinds of um, what kinds of seeds and feed you might provide uh, locally in Boulder. Um, so, um, so next slide, please, Kathy. Um, so um, I wonder if I could share my screen, Kathy, is that possible? Um, okay, let me see if I can do that because I changed up some of my slides. Um, so one second. Okay, can you see this? Yes. Okay, thank you, thanks. This is much better, all right. Um, 
Sorry about that. So I was speaking about um, uh, these nest boxes in our in our yards. Um, Cynthia uh, could tell you that the hair around this chickadee is actually um, from her dog Hank. The um, feathers around this little wren nest are actually from our hens and it perplexed the scientists from the CU um, Boulder chickadee study because they thought it was some large nesting bird in there. Um, then they noticed our, our chickens in our yard so um, conserving birds, I did mention about um, opening up a bird buffet. Um, this is a slide, this um, image here on the right, it's from Doug Tallamy's talk about um, his book. It's called The Nature of Oaks. This is um, actually a caterpillar on an oak tree branch and it's, it's camouflaged perfectly well. It survives through the winter frozen. And this is what these um, insect eating birds eat through winter. They'll um, crawl all over the branches of an oak tree or some of our other native trees looking for caterpillars, caterpillar uh, 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 larva. And um, uh, they can find these camouflage caterpillars and that just kind of blew my mind. Um, so, um, so if, so um, I guess what I'm, you guys, Beachikas can help me out here because I'm, I'm fairly um, feeling um, like a lot of this bird research is, is fascinating and new to me and I need um, sometimes a little bit of help, but um, let's go to the next slide. And um, this is what you can do in your yard to support, um, to support birds through, all seasons, um, bird baths. Bird baths are even helpful in winter. Um, birds need to clean their plumage uh, in order to be able to fluff themselves up to keep warm. So even on freezing days, you'll see um, you can see birds at feeders or, or at baths. Um, so it's good to even have a heater in your bird bath if you can. Um, so another important thing to have in your yard are some dead trees or what's called snags, like lots of bushes and brambles piled high. This is in our yard and a couple days I went out to see uh, if I could get a picture of it and I heard a thumping noise and it was a, a hole in the side of the, the dead tree uh, and a little nuthatch thumping. And um, in a, after this um, slide, uh, Kathy is going to show you a little video of that. Um, you can put nest boxes, but make sure they're species specific because if you put just a general box um, for a bird, you may not, you probably won't get anything. But if you look up the requirements, the birds have measuring tapes and they know what they like and use cedar or redwood. Um, didn't even scare her when I came right up close to her and tried to talk to her. So I'm running over time, but let me finish um, just a little bit about um, uh, what other things you can do in your yard. Um, lights out at 11 p.m. A dark sky is important because birds um, get drawn off their migratory path by bright lights from cities, and they end up like like hitting the sides of skyscrapers and windows. Um, so make your windows safer day and night. This is um, uh, our window in the daytime. We put chalk markers on our windows because the hummingbirds and other birds were flying into our windows. So um, a feeder close to a window is actually safer than um, 10 feet away because the, the, the birds slow down for the window. But during the daytime, the reflections from your window look like the outdoors and they just fly right into them. Um, and then protect our grasslands. Um, Waterfowl and marsh birds are doing really great because of hunters and lots of their conservation efforts. If we could do the same thing for grasslands, some of our grassland birds can recover. Um, and then let your lawn grow longer, especially in the spring uh, when you have um, dandelions too for the bees. But um, insects really appreciate the longer grasses and birds can, um, can find shelter in there. And then um, a few bird resources. The Cornell Lab is great, all about birds.org to identify species. And then this birdconservancy.org, it's conserva um, bird conservancy, uh, the Rockies 
um, bird conservancy uh, um, organization. They have great uh, ideas for what you can do in your backyard. There's also um, Boulder Audubon um, group, and you can look at the 400 species in Boulder County and, and make a checklist for yourself. So, whoops. So that is it for birds. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. That was great. And um, we, uh, we're, we ran over. We will stay until five if anybody has any questions, but we ha also have some action items for you to look at. Take action for Earth Day, and we think of Earth Day as every day. So top ones, plant a native, native tree, shrub, or flowering plant. We've also, with Tracy's last um, point, we've pledged a no mow May. So we're hoping not to mow our lawns until June, which will provide forage and more flowers um, to the bees. And um, so just let flowers grow in your lawn. And so um, that's about it. I mean, you can read through that. That's posted on our, our website, which is beechicas.com. And uh, we would love any questions if you have questions for us now. We have, a, we have a question from Andrea. Shall we pull out roots from invasive plants? I would, could, and you could probably give some examples like bindweed and some other things. I think you can pull out the roots. Um, Cynthia went through her vegetable garden, she might want to tell you, um, and pulled out individual weeds from the vegetable garden, leaving the soil structure intact. Also, after the dandelions bloom, we love dandelions, make meadows, not lawns. Um, we pull out our dandelions, some of us do, and try to get down there. But just what we're, we're talking about is not turning over the earth and, and disrupting the, the balance of the soil structure. But yes. Well, and that, and that fits in nicely with the next question. So does digging with the spade destroy the structure of the soil? Uh, it does. If you're turning it over, if you're bringing what's down below, like double digging, I know that's a practice that people have done for for a while, but it actually does destroy the soil structure. But just digging okay. to digging. plant. Right. If you're going to put in something with a trowel or, you know, a shrub, right, yeah. or a tree, you've got to get in there and dig. Yes. But I'm, I was just talking about overturning large areas with um, deep digging. Sure. And okay. on that invasive question, I have a super invasive um, campanula that I'm trying to get rid of in one of my beds. I have tried to do it very tenderly with, you know, cutting it all down. And then I've tried spot digging and that thing is not going away. So, <laughs> I mean, at certain points, as much as you don't want to totally disturb the soil, I, I've had to, it's a very invasive plant and this year in particular, and my plan is to just put annuals in that bed for now until I can monitor it and make sure it's not coming back. And then I'll replace it with natives. But, you know, it's kind of a, it's, it is dependent on the situation is what I would say. And let me tell you for the last two years, I've had pond liner, which is like a heavy yeah. rubber over a certain area that had agapodium, which is bishop's weed, which is super invasive. Never buy that at a garden center. And I've had it covered for two years with mulch. I'm taking it up this year. I'm gonna use my broad fork to open up the soil um, and put compost on it, water it, spray it with compost tea once I plant it with natives and try to you know, get that soil nutrition uh, microorganisms back in the soil. But um, Sometimes you just have to cover it up and yeah. it. that's a that's an excellent point. That is another strategy for sure. And I would just add going forward, um, there's this author named Larry Weiner who is an ecological gardener, and he talks about getting rid of the invasives first, like Teresa has done, and then going in and weeding around the plants that you've planted. Um, pulling them out for the first two years. And then after that, only cut off every weed, including invasive thistles or everything. Um, just cut them off at the ground. Don't disturb the soil and cut off the plants um, as low as you can to the ground. And then the, the plants that are there, if they're natives especially, 
they will outcompete those weeds for light and water. So don't overwater because weeds love water and cut off your weeds instead of pulling them up because like thistles and bind weeds, if you pull them, they will then branch right where you've pulled and they will become five or 10 plants from every cut that you make. And so for thistles, you're supposed to cut them off at the ground uh, for three years straight and then you'll be done with them. I hope so. <laughs> principle. Yes. Yeah. Speaking as someone in a community garden with lots of bindweed. Um, so Cynthia, we have a question. I live in the mountains and don't have a lawn that I mow, but we have a wild space with grasses that we cut down just twice a summer. Do you have any advice for adding flowers to that space, especially wild and native varieties? Definitely. Um, what I would say is if you're planting that area with seeds, you could try seeding it. Don't really disturb the soil too much, but just try to overseed some of really some native plants like um, Coreopsis and Liatris. Um, what else, Teresa? Would, well, we add? Um, would you recommend uh, seeding in the fall? You know, I would. Yeah, you can either seed right now, right, and seed right now, as long as you keep that um, a little bit moist until germination. But some people say if you're trying to plant natives, that you should plant them over the top of the the snow or in the in the late fall so that they stay on the ground and get watered in, and then don't put extra um, water on it because mm -hmm. if you do then that will encourage all the weed seeds that are there that are the non-native invasive weed seeds whereas the um, native seeds will germinate and they will grow some native seeds take two or three like penstemons can take two or three years to germinate so you have to be patient and just keep overseeding because if you add plants like that you dig in you will have to water that plant and um, so you might experiment and plant a few plants, but just water very carefully just that plant by hand maybe. Um, but I recommend the seeding method. And there's um, a book by, I think it's John Hitch, Hickmo, Hitchmo, um, who is, it's, I'll look that up and maybe try to put it in the chat, but it's all about um, seeding gardens for native plants, which is- So in, in my native garden that I'm gonna plant this spring, I'm going to plant <laughs> three to five plants that, you know, like uh, Galardia aristata, which is blanket flower, or Erigeron speciosa, which is aspen daisy. But then I'm gonna seed, you know, I'll put in the penstemons, penstemon, Rocky Mountain penstemon, or Rocky Mountain columbine, and put in a few plants just to show the area and block it off and then seed the rest. It's very economical too. It is, and it also give, it just provides a little bit of color you know without having to wait three years when you if you can pop in some plants and even hand water them it just gives you something beautiful to look at while you let the rest of it establish because some of those plants like flax i think that they might bloom the first year rocky yep. mountain bee plant cleome cleome that plant blooms that's an annual and reseeds too yep. but yeah uh, those perennials take two or three years to bloom great thank you um, Tracy, will you speak to the benefits of the tomato horn, uh, sorry, the tomato hornworm becoming a beneficial hummingbird moth? Yeah, so if you if you see the tomato hornworm, your first in instinct might be to pull it off, but you're either you're feeding a, a brood of new chicks or you're going to have this beautiful hummingbird sphinx moth after, um, you know, to help pollinate. So if you can plant a little extra for the bugs, um, I think then you have, you know, a bigger biodiversity in your yard. <laughs> I hope that answers that. Or yeah. plant, plant an extra tomato. Yeah. For the insect pests. I mean, most of us have plenty to share. We, we <laughs> yeah. should introduce this, the top, you know, the uh, concept of sharing our gardens with insects. And what, than getting what, rid of them. Yeah, and what Deborah was saying about takes 10 steps back is you don't notice the chomps or the bites out of your um, out of your trees or your bushes um, unless you look really closely. But if you stand further back, you don't even notice it. And they're only munching like some small fraction of the whole tree. And your natural predators will come if you leave it alone. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, could you answer Eric's question? Where do you advise to buy native plants? So we've got Harlequins, which is local. Where else would you recommend? Flower bin in Longmont. McGuckins? McGuckins doesn't have natives yet, but we are, um, cha we are championing, championing a um, new native plant initiative. It'll be the final, it'll be the last two weeks of May. And um, Teresa did the logo for it. There it is. Get growing, dig a spot for Colorado native plants. Um, so there'll be more information unfolding about this um, in the next few weeks, but the last two weeks of May, Sturts and Copeland, McGuckins, Flower Bin, um, Water, Harlequins will all have native plant um, displays and native plants available to all of us. So if you're looking for native plants, there'll be a lot of plant stock available the latter half of May. Yeah, and Growing Gardens right near you as, as well. Growing yeah. Gardens, yeah. Do they feature a lot of natives during their plant they, sale? They do, yeah. Super. That's the yeah. first three weekends of May is Growing Gardens plant sale. Exactly. Oh, and Thank you, Catherine. I was going to also say the Denver Botanic Gardens has a sale. Yeah. And there's also, I think it still might be open, the Native Plant Society. They're doing an online sale. Denver Botanic Gardens is doing online and in person this year. So, um yeah, there's a lot of sources out there for you. Great. And then, um, Tracy, do you want to mention the importance of finding plants that are neonicotinoid free if folks don't live near the garden places you've mentioned? Oh, yeah. So this is something we still want to ask our, um, our plant suppliers uh, so that all plants eventually will become neonicotinoid free. Um, that's affecting our whole ecosystem to the oceans. So it's really, really important to ask for plants that are free of free of pesticides if you can, um, all pesticides. But neonicotinoids are, are, yeah, one of the most common right now. Wonderful. Well, I think we've answered everyone's questions in the chat. And I want to encourage people to go to bechicas.com to find many more uh, resources that the Chicas have put together. There, are, You can also find the videos that we've done previously, and I'm sure they would love to hear from you for other questions. Mm -hmm. um, the I wanted to say that I will, let me show the, the um, slide of the next workshop because it relates to this one. Um, is this, yeah, is this, is this Deborah? Is this your, are you leading this one? Yes, I think Cynthia, Teresa, and I are all leading it. And so can you tell us what people will learn at this next workshop compared to today? Well, um, for May, we want to sort of do a top 10 list of Colorado natives. So we'll get into more detail on our favorite plants with a little bit more growing details and some other specifics. But um, it'll focus just on plants and um so we will go into more depth about how to grow them and probably uh, be able to answer questions about mass plantings and, and small gardens alike. Great. And Thank I was so just going to add really quickly, it's James Hitchmo, Sewing Beauty is the name of the book. And I don't think I have access to all of the chats that everybody can, can see. But um, thank you. Wow, that was magic. <laughs> Shannon. But this is a, it's a wonderful, beautiful book, and um, it applies to Colorado. And actually, there's a demonstration of that method at the Denver Botanic Gardens in their hell strips along Josephine. They only seeded it. And now, three years later, it's stunning. So go take a look at that. And then Catherine's also showing that Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks has an herb herbarium, which is a great place to learn about local natives. Have any of you been to that location? I have not. I, want, I don't know where it is. I didn't great. know that either. Maybe Catherine, can you tell us? Yeah, tell us more. It is. <laughs> that would be great. And then we did have another question come in. Um, Eric's asking, what is the best time of year to plant most natives? And I think you talked about sowing seeds in the fall as well as now. Are there other tips? You Whenever like you can work the soil is when you can plant natives. Most in throughout the winter, don't plant anything in like the heat of August or July. Um, but, you know, 
you can plant if you're if you are out in your garden in November and you can work the soil, you can plant a native. You can plant a native in February if you can work the soil. So that's a rule of thumb. Yeah, and I've noticed when we talk to BBB Seed that they their seed packets, the wildflower seed packets, are designed to be planted any time of the year because you've got the, the ones that'll do well in fall or winter or spring. And so it, I think Teresa was mentioning that some seeds just need a few season, you know, several seasons of winter or the what do you call it? This cold stratification. Yep. For it yeah. to bloom yes. or to sprout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and every plant is different. You might. Um, they have different requirements, so you can't be a total generalist on all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that correction, Cynthia. That makes sense. <laughs> so thank you for watching. This concludes Gardening for the Birds and the Bees of the Bee Chicas. Thank you, Deborah Foy, Cynthia Scott, Teresa Beck, and Tracy Bell Humer for inviting us into your homes and for teaching us to make scientific observations with creativity and hands-on products, getting our hands in the soil and supporting pollinators and insects that make a, for a healthier earth and for all of us. Thank you for teaching us um, throughout our, our season of being online during COVID. Um, mm -hmm. We are supporting our soil food web and the birds and native pollinators in our environment. Shannon, thank you for being in the background as the broadcast engineer and to the Boulder Library Foundation for the generous support to make these programs free for the public. And thank you all of you who tuned in to ask these great questions. And as I said earlier, I invite you to attend the next workshop with the Bee Chicas, Growing Native Plants for Colorado Pollinators on May 12th at four o'clock. It will be broadcast live on YouTube and Facebook, just like today. And look for an Instagram post from the Bee Chicas and the library asking for your questions before the next workshop. We'd like to tailor that to what you're curious about. So finally, if you know others who would enjoy this event, the session has been recorded and will be available to watch on the Boulder Public Library's Seed to Table YouTube playlist and the Beach Chicas playlist, which you can subscribe to. Visit boulderlibrary.org Seed to Table website for upcoming programs.